wanted to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Rodrigo uh, Bias, and he is here uh, locally in the Bay, but I wanted to give you an idea of what he uh, has been doing. I was impressed. Right? It took me a while to find out what he's done, but when, when I saw everything he's been involved with, it was amazing. He has worked with turtles, <laughs> trout, terrestrial plants, octopus, kelets, whelks, lobsters, urchins, dolphins, and now kelp systems and food, and there's a bunch of other stuff in there too. Yeah, he's been all over the place. He started off in Guadalajara, that's where you got your bachelor's degree. Did a lot of programs, internships, volunteerships, research assistantships. He ended up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. <laughs> which, you know, that's... that's I was the only Mexican there, probably. In the whole state? <laughs> I, was, I was so lucky. <laughs> Latin lover. How was the Mexican food? The Mexican, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I had uh, to learn. at the Darling Marine Center out, out in Maine working with uh, Bob Stenick, and that was in 2000. That was about 10 years after I was there doing it, and he was doing some lobster work and some urchin work out there, and a lot of diving, it sounds like. Um, he then came to Hopkins, did some time at Santa Barbara and Fullerton, um, Stanford, and Austin. Texas as well, um, working on a biocomplexity project. He got his master's degree at Sucesse down in Mexico, then came up here to work in the Carver Mundi lab, which uh, we're all quite familiar with at UC Santa Cruz, and again, starting to do some kelp forest work. Uh, your dissertation, if I have it correctly, was the development and application of mass balanced ecological network models for kelp forest ecosystems, a little bit of which we're going to Yes. Look at today, given your title. And then he got uh, his first job after that was a postdoc at Hopkins in Theo Michelli's lab. Yes. And now he's got a real job. He's a new faculty member as of like this month or last mm -hmm. month at uh, UABC in Ensenada. Yes, correct. correct. So he's down there. And so he's been all over the place. He's done a lot of good stuff. And we're all just really happy for him to be here. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for being here. And before I start, I want to thank a lot of people that make this possible. This is a lot of work that I could not have done it by myself, and I want to recognize Steve Cunningham and a bunch of other, bunch of other people that, that this is a collaborative effort. And I'm just, it happened to be me to give you this, this talk, but there's a lot of people behind me. So if you have complaints about modeling in Cal Forest ecosystems, <laughs> Just like what happens with Halpern, uh, just, just, just give me a break. <laughs> this is a very challenging audience to me. Uh, and also I want to thank some of my funding sources. Uh, ecologies, ecological ne network models are used by ecologists to describe communities. These communities, you, you have to know how many species in the system there are and how these species are connected. With these two basic uh, numbers, you can estimate properties of the community, such as uh, connectance or traffic level. But these communities vary across the board and because they are responding to different sources of variation. And to understand what determines this variation in the structure, function, and dynamics of communities, is, this is a question very important for ecologists. And to attack this question, people have tried to develop uh, experiments to get at the causation of the, of the species interactions. However, experiments are usually spatially or temporarily limited. Other approach is to do observational studies such as monitoring programs where you can increase the temporal and spatial resolution, but you cannot get at the causation because there are so many confounding effects. Another approach is to do modeling where you can control drivers and perform simulations However, and this is very important for all you guys, this is only an abstraction of a reality. I'm not saying I'm, I'm telling you lies. I'm just telling you this is an abstraction. This is a simplified way to look at this system. And, but to my mind, the best approach combines all these three. Uh, information from experiments with ecological monitoring data into this model to generate hypotheses and predictions about how the, the ecosystem responds respond to sources of variation. This is a table uh, of a list of different models. I am enlisting some of the most popular ones, and these guys are ordered by the number of species or functional groups they can work with. The next column represents what's the currency of the model, how they work, and most of them are biomass or nutrients. Um, the, the rest of the columns 
are characteristics of each model and are characteristics they can accommodate or are required by the model. But I want you to focus on the, on the one at the bottom. It's a mass balance, ecopath with ecosyn model. I will explain what, it, what that means later, but I just want to, to show you that because of its utility and relative simplicity, is the one that I'm using to explore all, all these ideas that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, these uh, mass balance models have proven to be very useful in informing ecosystem-based management. And, and to get at the questions of how changes in management affects the ecosystem, and this in turn affects the economy of the place, uh, exploiting the resources of that ecosystem. And as I told you, I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to put this in the framework of a uh, Gulf Forest ecosystem, because it's one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, they provide biogenic habitat for a lot of species of fish, invertebrates, mammals, birds, and other species of algae. They subsidize other ecosystems, and they are ecologically and economically important, as they provide a lot of ecosystem services for humans. But to make sure that we keep getting all those ecosystem services from this system, especially under all these sources of variation, we need to understand how the interactions and the biomass of all these different functional groups and species in the system will behave under different conditions. So this is a, a figure that I helped design for their chapter, for their book chapter, and it's a simplification of a kelp forest in Central California. And still a simplification, I wanna show how complex and diverse this ecosystem is. And basically what I want to explore is what happens if you change the biomass of any group in the system, specifically the higher level predators uh, to simulate fishing? Or what happens if you change the biomass of the primary producers, uh, just simulating, for one example, climate or warming up the ocean? And basically, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on these two questions. What are the ecosystem what effects of fishing in the kelp forest? And what are the ecosystem what responses to the dynamic of giant kelp. First, let's talk about fishing the kelp forest. Uh, effects of fishing on kelp forest have been previously documented. This is only one example in the Channel Islands, where when you fish a uh, lobster, you, you, produce a you release the predation on sea urchins, and this generates an intensive grazing on the, on, the, on the kelp. If you stop fishing lobster, the population regulation on sea urchins happen, and the abundance of the biogenic habitat increases. However, this system is not as simple as this picture shows. Uh, I have increased the complexity of the, of the system in this figure, taking into account 25 different nodes, including fish, uh, invertebrates, algae, and mammals. And what I wanna show you in this figure is that all these species circle in, in red, are species that are currently exploited, and the ones in blue are historically exploited. So as you can see, it's a very uh, fished uh, uh, ecosystem. Hence the importance of exploring all these models about fishing in kelp forest ecosystem. So this is where I explain a little bit how the, or what does ecosystem model means and what's mass balance. So ECOPATH is the common name for this mass balance model that I'm using. and It's a static description of the structure and energy flow in the community. So basically it describes how the energy flows. Uh, it's called mass balance because it's governed by this super simple linear equation and both sides of the equation needs to be, they have to be equal, they need to be balanced. Whatever you put in the system, you're going to get it in the, in the rest of the term in the, in the, in the equation. So for example, if you want to estimate the, pro the, the production biomass of a group in the system, for example, in this case, the kelp rockfish, you have, it's going to be equal to how much energy goes to, to fishing, how much energy goes to the pre predators, how much energy goes to another system by migration, and there's a biomass accumulation term that describes how much energy gets from lower trophic levels. And finally, and this is the balancing procedure, Whatever it's, whatever it's not taken into account in all those terms, it goes to the detritus. Usually the detritus is, is calculated or estimated by the model because it's the, 
this, the valve of the, of the system. To run this model, you have to parameterize it first. And it needs a lot of data from all these different sources. So for example, the production uh, of any group in the system, uh, needs, you need to get it. And I'm going to describe where, the, where this data come, came from. First, I'm going to tell you about this cool, sexy online database that we have developed with the help of a lot of people. And it's hosted at UC Santa Cruz. And, and it's an ecological online database, which means that we host information about natural history traits and demographics of right now 829 different species or groups of species associated with kelp forest. Uh, we have identified uh, 3,600 interactions and every single piece of information is cited uh, where that information came from. And so this is basically a, a, an effort of, of literature search. Uh, we are 87 users right now. And, and as you can see, we have identified a lot of interactions and a lot of species, but there's a ton more work to do because this is like a growing monster that it's going to never, I will never finish this project. <laughs> but, but you can help to make it <laughs> better. Every single piece of information is also special and temporarily explicit. And it's especially explicit by three different layers, by region, uh, by area, or by a 20 kilometer grid along the coast from, from Bering to Baja. Um, and what it's important for you, I, I suppose, is how do I get this information? So it's, there's a query system that you can just go and visit the website and you can download all this information, as they call it, free beer, free speech. You don't have to do anything, you just go download it and, and go and model yourself a kelp forest. So this is the, the query that I use for my models, and it's just an example or one column, you get the species names, and then the biomass uh, estimation generated by the model, by the, by the database, which is tons per square kilometer. A production biomass term, it's also a, by year, it's in tons of tons per square kilometer by year, and the consumption biomass for all these different functional groups. And as you can see, there's a lot of unknowns, and, and those can be uh, estimated from other models, from in situ measurements, or they can be estimated by, by the modeling and the, within the balancing procedure. Another big piece of information that we can get from this database is the species interactions, which is required to build these models. And, and, and this is probably the, the most useful part of this e ecological uh, database. So with this information uh, and more, uh, like monitoring data, I'm not just going to run through these guys, but there's PISCO monitoring data along the coast of Central California. They have 126 sites and they have been doing it for uh, 13 years, plus 13 years. And so there's a big, uh, big data set. There's also the USGS, Team Tinker, and GMSTs, uh, sea otter population and diet information. And most recently, more recently there's this data set available uh, of kelp biomass estimated by uh, divers and Landsat images. Uh, whatever we could not find in the, in, the, in the literature or in these databases, uh, we had to go and get it. So we did a bunch of different uh, field uh, trips <laughs> and to collect information of species. For example, this is the case of a land weight equation of Pycnopodia in, at Hopkins right before the sister wasting disease. Probably some influence there. But uh, <laughs> another term in the equation is fishing mortality. That information I got from stock assessments. And this is years. Uh, the last 50 years or so, uh, biomass metric tons of, of in this case, lingo. The black line represents the, the biomass of this species, and the red line uh, following the second y-axis is the, the exploitation rate or catch rate. And I use those, those information to, to parameterize these models. And not just for that species, but for a bunch of other species in the system. Predation, uh, mortality I got from the database, 
as well as migration. However, for the ex examples that I'm going to show you today, migration for me was set to zero. It was an assumption that it was a closed box and it didn't communicate with other kelp forests. Um, biomass accumulation, you can, get, you can get those information from the database or from other model estimates. And the production, as I told you, the production that goes to the detritus, it's all calculated by the, by the model. So back to the question, what are the ecosystem-wide effects of fish in kelp forest? And to do that, I, I put together a set of specific questions. Where the first one is, to what extent that fishes, fishing alter the, the biomass of the other uh, species? For example, if you fish, link up what happened to the biomass of the rest of the species. This is the species and the mean catch rate from, from, from stock assessment. What happens if you fish cabezon, or greenlings, or blue rockfish, or black rockfish, or gopher rockfish? Or what happens uh, uh, if the, the difference of when you catch one or the other one are the same, or they're different? That's, that's kind of the question that I wanted to go. Another question is how fishing any of these species affect the interactions with the other species. For example, if you fish lingot, what happens to the species that are directly interacting with lingot? What happens to the species that are indirectly interacting with uh, lingot in a second or third de degree of separation? And what happens if you don't fish lingot? You fish cabezon, if the results are the same, or blue rockfish. And the third question, a specific question was asking, what happens if you fish them all at the same time? Uh, this is the first result. Uh, this is very standard for, for results of ECOPAD with ECOSIM. This is a mixed traffic impacts matrix. This describes the, the impacts on one group to another group. And this impact can be, have a direction. It can be positive or negative, And it has a magnitude. And this is indicated by the size and the color of the, of the bubble. Uh, black bubbles are negative impact, and the size of the bubble is the, the intensity of the impact. These guys on the, on the y-axis are affecting the, y's on the, the guys on the x-axis. And for example, you see sea otters have negative impacts on all the species that they eat on. For example, sea urchins, abalone, crabs, and others. And they also have... A, a, a negative impact on their self, probably by competition. Another example is lingot. It has big negative impact on cabezon. And in this model, at least, cabezon is said to be the, prime, the, the favorite prey item for lingot. And you can, you can see it here. Another example, lower in the trophic uh, level, is crabs that have negative impacts on all the other invertebrates, but positive impacts on the things that are feeding from, from from them. And finally, uh, the last example is Keldotritus, that it has positive effect on most of the, the, the nodes in the system. And another way to look at this information, instead of bubbles and a complicated matrix, you can just see a picture, which is not easy either. But, but you see that it changed the colors and the bubbles to lines and, and to thickness of the line. What I wanted to show you is that don't pay attention, it's just the, this is Lincoln and these are the other species and they're connected to one another in positive and negative effects. They're all pairwise. And when you increase uh, fishing on, on, on Lincoln, these uh, relationships change. I did that to every single species in the, in the model that I showed you before and these changes are all different. The way to quantify it is staring at them for, for years. <laughs> and this is exactly what I did until I find out that there's a better way to look at the data. <laughs> and so this is, this is, I guess, the most important result that I'm going to show you today, but it's also the more uh, difficult to, to, to defend. You'll see. This is the ecosystem. This is uh, the functional groups, order from higher trophic level to lower trophic level. So you have all the fish and inverts and, and the algae there. This is no fishing, and when you don't have fishing, this is the, the biomass change. 
when you have a system in a stable equilibrium and then you stop fishing it. This is what happens. Uh, the, the, link, uh, the biomass of Lincoln increases and the biomass of all the other fish decreases. In contrast, if you have a fishing area, uh, you fish lingot, this is only fishing lingot, the, 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 the biomass of lingot goes negative and the rest of all the species go positive. So this has a meaning in, if you have an MPA and you have a lingot in an MPA, you probably won't see in this model, you probably won't see any effect of the MPA because you have a, a top predator eating a lot of things from the, from the system. However, if you have an MPA where the only thing that you catch is lingot, you have the increased biomass of all the different species groups. So there's a lot of arguments that we can go over years and years and years, but this is one thing that the model s states that we can go actually and test and design an experiment or keep monitoring to, or dive into the data specifically with this question in monitoring data sets. Anyway, so I did the same with blue rockfish and similar patterns show up. Blue rockfish is kind of in the center, in the heart of the food web, or at least in this food web, and it's the most common species of fish and it's fueling the, the, the community. That's why it has similar impacts. However, when you fish the rest of the species or you don't fish them, the, the, the difference are very, very minimal. Uh, this is the results when you fish them all at the same time. Uh, what you can see is that there's an extended effect across the network with large and variable changes in biomass. Uh, in summary, uh, for, for this part, uh, we have the greatest magnitude in direct and indirect effects, both in lingot and blue rockfish, and lower magnitude and only in the direct interactions for the rest of the, the species. The, the effect of fishing one of these species is extended only in lingot and blue rockfish, but in the other ones is very limited to the species that are around. Um, the changes in biomass are large in those two species again, but uh, very marginal in the rest of the species. And when you fish them all, the, there's a broad, large mixed changes when you fish them all at the same time. And finally, for this part of the, uh, for this part of this modeling exercise, I wanted to look, how, this is only a static picture of the time, how, how you fish the system looks like. But what happens if you fish them every single year for 30 years? And, and to do that, I modified the, that governing equation that you saw before into a, a rate of change of the biomass of any group in the system. And it's going to be equal to the growth efficiency and a term of mortality by predation. So you have to take into account all, all the predators. Uh, immigration term that I set to zero for, for this exercise and a, uh, and a term for other mortality like natural mortality and fishing and emigration to another one, which is zero. But so in other words, what this model does is you have a, a, a food web and you anchor that food web to a time series that you know and you let the rest of the system follow that time series. And this is basically what the model does. However, there's a big assumption about it. To run this model, you have to assume that the ecosystem at time, uh, time one is at the initial conditions is, is in equilibrium, and then it has to go through the, the pattern that you set it but eventually at the end of the run, it has to reach another the same equilibrium point or another, but it has to be in equilibrium. And so what I did was fish different rates. The number one is the average uh, catch rate for, for all the generated by the stock assessment, and then I increase it by 1.5 times, two times, or three times. And pay attention on the colors because they're going to be important later. And also, I decrease fishing by half or completely stop fishing any of these uh, groups in the system. Uh, and I did it for all these different species again. And these are the results from that dynamic model. On the x-axis, you have time. It's about 30-year run. On the y-axis is relative biomass. And, and they're all different units, so I, I just, uh, uh, zoom in to show the pattern. 
And when you fish link code, uh, you can see the, that the biomass increases if you stop fishing, or if you fish it, the biomass decreases exponentially. And Cabezon responds opposite direction. However, you can see all across the board a mono, uh, monotonic response. If you are going to go up because of fishing link code, you're going to go up. Or if you're going to go down, you're going to go down. And this is only a probability that you're going, your biomass is going to increase or decrease. Uh, if you fish Cabezon, uh, there's nothing really happening in the, in the model other than uh, a change in Lincoln because it's a fi favorite uh, predator. And, and similar responses happen with the rest of the species, just like green lins, blacks, and gophers. However, when you fish them all at the same time, there's all these trajectories that are not monotonic. They, sometimes they increase, sometimes they decrease, and this, is, this gets more complex on how you fish the different species in the system and how much. In summary for this dynamic part, uh, there's monotonic trajectories when you fish them one at the same time, and some, there's winners and losers. Sometimes some uh, species go up, sometimes go down, but they're always over, go down or go down. When you fish them all, there's all these dynamics that we need to understand a little bit better. And this is about fish. This is not about fishing anymore. This is the second part. And what happens to the biomass density of the different, of the different functional groups? So if you change the primary production, how everything is going to respond? And the second specific question is how the distribution of biomass is going to vary. So as, as you remember, these are models that describe how the flow of energy, uh, if you have more or less kelp, is the flow of energy changing? And so what I, this is what I'm exploring. And what is, which is the temporal response of the biomass of all these different scenarios? The, the data that I use here is generated by this Landsat model. Mary Young and, and collaborators use this uh, algorithm provided by Cavanaugh in Santa Barbara. I guess he's in UCLA now, I don't know for sure, but what these guys did, they took a bunch of pictures from, from satellite images and, and along the coast. And they have different colors, uh, for, for example, one year. And so they sent divers to the different colors of, the, of each, each patch, and the divers counted how many fronts they had. And, and they put it together and estimated how much biomass there was in each patch. And I'm using that information to inform this model. Basically, what I did is plot every single patch of kelp in the Central California coast. And I chose that one, which is Piedras Blancas, I think, uh, because it has a ton of kelp all the time. So this is the biomass, and this is the coefficient of variation. So this side has a ton of kelp all the time. This one here is North Santa Cruz, has very little kelp all the time. This one, it's kind of high biomass of kelp, but it's variable, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And this one is um, low biomass, and it's variable, sometimes it doesn't. So if you want to look at the time series of each of these sites, uh, I'm, I'm building a model for each of these scenarios. So the first two are low biomasses, and these are orders of magnitude lower than these guys. But so this low variable, it's like this one time in that patch, there was kelp, this one time. And so these are the types of things that I'm going to be looking at. Uh, for example, this high variable, it had a lot of, some, some kelp sometimes, but there this one year that had a ton of kelp. So when you run the model, this is the, the results. Here, this is the high constant. In a kelp forest that always have kelp and a ton of kelp, the biomass density of kelp was higher, obviously, but also the community biomass, which is the, the, the great one. The, com the, the overall community biomass, the, the, the total throughput of this system is way higher than any other scenario. And the rate of change was way higher, too, in comparison with the rest of them. 
when you look in contrast with to the low variable, there's a negative effect on the change. So even the, the, the system throughput shrinks when you don't have enough kelp to, to feed the system. However, when you have a low constant and a high variable, the, the patterns are similar. You are sort of familiar with these ones, but it's, it's uh, functional groups on the x-axis order from high to low trophic levels, and this is biomass change. So the, 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 biomass, the biomass of every single functional group decreases when you, when you don't have kelp. Uh, obviously, because it's a kelp forest, and the model is said to have kelp feeding abalones and urchins and all these species. When you have a low variable, the, 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 um, the biomass change is even more negative. In contrast, when you have a high variable and a high contact, constant, you have an increasing biomass. And both increase regardless of the variation, and it's a uniform response. Like That means all across the system. And this is, this is a plot that it's, highlights what it, why this result is important. This is the coefficient of variation on the y-axis and the functional groups on the x-axis. And I divided in these for two by two. On the top, you have low variance. So this is uh, kelps that don't change much. And on the bottom, you have uh, high variance. And you can see that the, the mean variance of the high variable kelp forest, it's fourfold increased. So the biomass, uh, changes a lot in these places. And this is important for, for spe especially the invertebrate groups. So if you want to take a look at how, vari how variable is a kelp forest, uh, this suggests that you, you should look into the invertebrate group when, when it's not a kelp forest that always have kelp and it's always constant. When you run the, the simulation for for, for the dynamic model, this is again the, ti the time and the biomass. You can see that changes, if you fix the model to the canopy kelp, there's a, a lot of variability in the, in the uh, invertebrate group, but this variability decreases as you climb up the, the trophic uh, levels. Uh, in summary, for, for this exercise, the, there's difference in total network biomass. So when you have a kelp forest with a ton of kelp all the time, it's very different to the rest of them. High constant giant kelp biomass generates the, the greatest change. And the low and variable biomass even gets a decline on the biomass of the rest of the groups. The highest variation in invertebrate groups was found except for the high and constant kelp biomass. And these ecological models can help us understand what happens if you fish an ecosystem or some changes in the ecosystem. Uh, I want to highlight the importance of having uh, results from an experiment, uh, e uh, data from monitoring programs and models, and put together those in, in, and merge them into a feedback loop that when you run a model, you inform a better experiment, and then the better experiment will inform or refine a monitoring program. Then you're going to make a better model, and so on, and so on. So I'm, I'm not doing models, like theoretical models. I'm trying to use the most data available. And, and I think this is useful because of, of the times that we're facing right now. For example, over-exploitation or, or climate change. We need to be able to predict and this is what fishermen in Baja are asking us all the time when we go there. We say, okay, it's cool that you have uh, 30 years of data. Tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. And sometimes you're not able to say it. You, you can describe what happened, but you cannot say. And they know what happened because they've been fishing that place forever. But they want to know what's happening. So modeling, it's, it's a big part of what we want to exploit more. There's this Godzilla and Niño coming up soon. And and the first effects are already happening in Baja, so it's worthwhile look, taking a look down south right now. And that's what I'm trying to bring all these models and all these skills to, to use a time series that we, the, 
uh, Fio has generated uh, down there, and she's going to tell you all the details about this stuff next week. She, she's a seminar speaker. But as you can see here, this is August last year and August this year. Even the, with the predicted big El Nino, the sea temperature, sea surface temperature was warmer than ever last year. So it, there's going to be a cumula cumulative impacts on these things. Um, what I want to do specifically is make these models in the south with all these different species from, from Baja California, but eventually bring all these expertise together here in Central California, in Alaska, in San Diego, and put together this uh, Bering to Baja project where we have data availability, we have long-term monitoring programs coming together and informing these and more parameters from these kinds of models or more. And I just want to say that, that the value of, of combining all these uh, efforts is going to be very important for the future understanding of kelp forest ecosystems. I think that's here. Oh. El Capitan. <laughs> now I'm happy to take questions, 40 minutes. slide where you had the list of, it, of organisms you're looking at and you had their biomass and their production biomass ratio. Do you that one? Like the third one? It was your query slide. You showed us the... Right. So let's just look at canopy kelp. <coughs> Assuming that's mostly giant kelp. Um, yes, the typical production of biomass ratio for giant kelp, that's about a order of magnitude too high. Typically, it's around four to six if you divide the production by the standing biomass. I, don't, I just wonder how you got 42.9. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the production biomass in this model uh, is how much biomass you need to produce every time step. And the time step begin, it's within one year. So remember that there's several assumptions for this thing. And that's why the, the numbers may be a little bit off, but they're informed from, from, from data. The thing is that you have a one square kilometer kelp kel forest. And in that uh, square kilometer, uh, you have all these biomass of all these different organisms. And you said that biomass for all these organisms based on monitoring, based on all this information. If you don't uh, produce that much kelp, you over, you, the grazers overtake the kelp. So the, this is how much kelp the system is producing every time. And that's why it's so high. I have to elevate. What's the, time, what's the time interval over which the production is supposed to occur? One year. In that square kilometer. But uh, anyway, that's the, I'm just thinking of the Amnese data and Val Gerard data. I, 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 so, this is how you run the model. You get advanced with data and I get it from all these, from all these species of algae. But once, when in the balancing procedure, you have to, we will highlight you. You have the production of kelp is not enough. You, you, you can only say how much biomass there is based on data, but then the production is, you have to, I had, and I assume that it had to be higher for my model to work. So you are right, it's probably a order of magnitude less. Um, That's an order of magnitude too high. Right, okay. So, it's a, it's, I don't want to say this, because it's not real organizing, but you have to tweak the model to make it work. And tweaking doesn't seem very scientific. It's not scientific, um, but it's pretty much what I did. I took the model to make it work. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that's a good answer. <laughs> I mean, if it works, so what? If it doesn't predict anything that happens in nature. No, it does, because it, it can, um, 
it didn't predict where. So you wait. Let me show you this. After you run your model and you parameterize this thing, this is how you cure the QC in your system. You, you know for, for sure there are species that are going to have a negative or positive effect of them. You probably don't know all of them, and that's why there's a value of ecosystem models. But you know for certain that uh, others are going to eat these things, and CAD is going to have positive effect on these other things, and negative effect on those things. And this is where you come on QAQC regardless of the tweaking uh, procedure. So if you are if you are happy with this one, uh, then you can not uh, happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Uh, I I was wondering, is there any historical fishing data that you can look at on changes in fishing practices that would maybe send or be kind of like a real life burden of your models of uh, changes in what you're fishing and how that. Is that why observations that show those same sort of changes in the health forest ecosystem that you're predicting in the model would happen? I, the, the only ones that I got, I mean, they're not necessarily from health forest, are the stock assessment data. And you can see there the, the, the these ones. So this goes back to the almost all the centers. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the biomass of all these different species of fish. There's some similar ones for Avalani, but not, not, not for it. Or not as good as this. Right? And so, but, but all of these estimations are offshore. And so it's hard to bring them back, bring them closer to the shore into the kelp forest. I, I don't know if, if I need them to do it. But also, it has the one. Um, yeah, it would just depend on those observations actually existing. So for the last five, almost ten years, there's been a lot of attempts to model health forest systems, near shore systems worldwide, right, mm -hmm. different areas. And for the most part, most of the ones I have seen have all shown or, or claimed to show that fishing actually has an impact at the kelp level. Right, you see a lot, of, and that's usually the title of the top known. After sitting through all of your slides, your kelp line was flat through every one of your fishing scenarios. Every single one of them, except you, you didn't talk about the fishing otters, but, but for the most part, every one of your situations, kelp was flat, was unaffected. Yes. Now that, that's at odds with all the previous people who modeled for less. So something's different here. It's either your technique. It's the data you've utilized or something else. And so I'm hoping you can say why your results are fundamentally different than other previous models. I, I, I think it's a, an artifact of the model because you're including a lot of different species. And when it's, once you want to make this quantitative, more than 20, for example, or, or 40, it's still potentially challenging to make the population growth and population models with a, within a, a, a Ecosystem model. What I mean is that uh, I think kelp forests are compartmentalized, and I'm trying to to make a big piece of the of the of the prediction. And to do that, I have to oh, uh, make obvious some things or, or, or a similar state to make it work. Otherwise, it will be crazy and become a big error and uh, also. I think because of this model was specifically designed to offshore, it's hard to bring it back and we have to make assumptions. And one of the big assumptions here is that the, the, the kelp is it's, it's never a limiting factor because you want to see the compartment dynamics on the top, not on the bottom. That's why I did two different models. And the other, the other part of this is that it's, you can't take into account threshold effects here because you have a linear model. Yes. Right, we already know that otter effects are threshold based, and so this would never be able to recover any of the otter dynamics because it is basically flatlined until you finally get otter abundances low enough to see an impact. 
So there's a lot of those that, that are realized in the health course that we know about that, that would not be able to be observed in, in this situation. The, yeah, there's these people in, in Alaska, her name is Otis, and she works for Fish and, Fish and Wildlife. She's taking this model to another level, and she's building different models for all these little islands in, in the coast of Alaska. And, and she has all these, she's including within the model uh, nonlinear relationships. For example, if you have a canopy kelp, you have a negative effect on the, on the <coughs> canopy, but that effect is nonlinear. So she's including all that, and, and she's, she's advancing these, these techniques further to better understand. The reason I was asking was because those were both technique-based questions and answers. The one result you did show was your four scenarios of Kelp, mm -hmm. right? High and constant, high and variable, low and constant, lower. And for the first three, Kelp was flat, the consumers were flat at 250, I forget what was in fact. You might be able to go to that slide. Regardless, if you're not high and constant with Kelp, regardless, you have a set secondary production of Bill. Uh, I think the value is 250. Yet when you add your highly, your high and constant kelp, things right here, it jumps to 67, right? Look, 216, 250, 251. Any of those three scenarios, it's not until you get to a, a large value kelp that's constantly there that you almost triple the secondary consumption. So for me, that's the result that I'm interested in because it fits a lot of our natural history and it fits a lot of what we know about Central California. But I don't want to get too excited about this result if it's due to the same assumptions that you're arguing for the other yes, side. Yes, you have to be careful. Yeah. It's probably an act of fact. Well, hopefully, you have to lay, you, you have to, you have to use this model the way you're thinking. Let's see if it's actually true. You have to. Because I would argue that call for is basically have a set community in the background, and then you add a lot of help, you get an enhancement to that community based on this large enrichment of the, of the giant cup. And this is also against the, uh, uh, intervene with these students and it makes no sense to even help her say it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Go down, I mean, uh, I'm just wondering if the model always came to equilibrium in the end. In the end, there were intrinsic variability. Eventually, for example, if you take a look at these, when you fish all the species at the same time, it looks like it doesn't, probably here. But I'm just doing a semi if that's. So it, it does come to an equilibrium. So there's so much, and it's an solution of the moment. This person that I'm talking about in Alaska, she is. Uh, not balancing the models, she's just running them without, uh, without the, the, the treatments about, uh, and she doesn't always get, uh, for some islands, she, for some islands she doesn't always get the, the, the clean report. I mean, it's interesting because, well, she's, it's a complicated thing, but, but for me it always goes back to the I and mean, it's a big assumption too. When, when you start, if when you start modeling, it was not making you never know. You have to assume for it. So I had two questions um, about some of the fish dynamics. The first, I was a little perplexed, so maybe I didn't see it correctly. It looked like when you did the static model, when you fished when you caught octopus populations, were positive, they grew. Right? But then in your dynamic model, when you fish and how you harder the octopus populations then decline with negative. So I'm just kind of curious what you would mean to those, those different dynamics. So in the static model, it's, you, run the, you run the model and you make it, uh, you balance it. And then from that balance model, you will stop fishing. You, you reduce mortality by fishing in the model or you increase it. And that's, that's how there's three different results for each static model. Uh, when you don't fish, uh, uh, you the
think this is one of the interview level. So I highlighted Dr. Booth because they have an opposite uh, uh, behavior. Yeah, right here, the demand is obviously not harder, but earlier one looked like they went up. Okay, sorry, you go. So they, they, they go up when you when you increase fishing. I mean, that's the question. When you're not fishing, Dr. Booth goes up. Isn't the green colors you mean? Harder, because rather be no fishing, right? Right. No fishing for me, can't they So when you, and I, this is what I think about the, the, the natural history of this system. If you have a ton of nickel, you have very little calcium. And calcium is, is one of the better But you saw something here from the set of I think it's similar. I think. The I just saw sort of assumes an equilibrium to start with, or a stability, right? Mm -hmm. So along with all the other assumptions you're making, it seems to me that we absolutely know that that's just wrong for kelp forests. I mean, over, certainly over tens of years, but often times, months of years in Central California, um, they're really quite better for all kinds of reasons. Um, so I mean, you know, I mean, if you don't incorporate that kind of information, um, how can a model ever be realistic? And I guess my ultimate question would be, at what point do you give up on this and say it really doesn't predict the future? And maybe we should not use modeling as an approach. It's because, I, mean, I don't think with modeling you can ever reach reality. It's because it's a model and it's, what a model is, it's just a, a, a prediction. And and the prediction might or not be. Uh, so, this is what uh, one of my advisors said. All of us are wrong. All of them. But some are useful. And, and what I would make the point here is that these are useful to highlight uh, things that the models uh, can show. For example, the, the interaction between fishing and link. If you have an MPA with a link, it might not be a, a great. I don't I'm saying the model is completely correct because there's so many variability and I'm making a, uh, I'm assuming a cat forest is a one square kilometer all across the central California. So just because of that, my results can, are completely biased. Um, but the information that I am generating or, or the spots that I'm highlighting for the system, I think, I think they're interesting to think about. You know, so you, you you don't buy the models, but you don't have to buy it. You just have to uh, uh, look at them and, and think about the system. And I think that's the value of these, these exercises. Because you have to go farther than just uh, describing what happened before. You have to go one step. Okay, so it's now 5 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and let her wriggle off the hook and wish you well. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back to the decision. Thanks for coming.